I'm going to read to you in a moment or two words from John chapter 3. It's about being born again. Have you ever heard that term? Saved. Converted. A lot of people have heard the terms, and yet they have been so much turned off. Why? Well, I'll tell you why. Many times there are people who use those terms, saying they're saved or born again, and who are more hypocritical than anything else. Or maybe you did meet a genuine Christian who said he was saved, and yet he failed somewhere and let you down, and then you got turned off the very term. Or maybe you're not aware of it at all. But there is a teaching in the Bible where Jesus said, ye, meaning you, must. No, 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 no two ways about it. You must be born again. Does that sound strange? Another way to say it is, you got to get saved by the blood of Christ. That's also strange, isn't it? The blood, that sounds pretty gory. Well, you've got to be converted. And people would say, does that mean just turning over a new leaf? What does it all mean? The truth is this, I am interested in you being saved. It's glorious to be saved. Yes, there's still battles and struggles and trials, but you will have the peace of God and you will know that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life and that if you should die, even while you're listening to me, it would be absent from the body and present with the Lord as long as you'd got saved before that happened. You don't have to pay for it. You don't have to get a special education. You don't have to go to a special church. You don't have to go to a different country. But just by calling upon the Lord in trust and faith, he can revolutionize you. And the Bible says, if any man be in Christ, that's another way to say being born again, he's a new creation. The old things have passed away and all things have become new. I really, really want you to be saved. But I'm going to read something to you, which really is a conversation between a brilliant man and a man that many looked upon just as a carpenter. And that doesn't mean a carpenter couldn't be brilliant, but this other man was so highly educated, and this man wasn't. This man was so in a leadership position, and this man wasn't. And they had a conversation. And it turned out very unusual. Let me read it to you, at least part of it at this time. This is John chapter 3, verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus. Now, we know Jesus was and is the Son of the living God. But back there, he was just looked upon as perhaps a teacher. In fact, a lot of people were against him. They thought he was a carpenter. The same, this great Nicodemus came to Jesus by night. And he said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For nobody can do these great miracles that you're doing except God be with him. So he had that clear in his mind. This man's got something. He's performing miracles. Jesus answered and said unto him, ignoring what seemed to be the compliment about Jesus performing miracles. And Jesus got right down to the point, talking to this great teacher, spiritual teacher of Israel. And Jesus said, Verily, verily, wherever it gives it twice, surely, surely, you better watch out. Jesus is zeroing in on some powerful truth. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, he was so specific, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. What? Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, saved, be in Christ, be converted, whatever way you want to say it, he cannot, no two ways about it, he cannot, see the kingdom of God, cannot be part of God and heaven and eternity with the Lord. 
Nicodemus, this brilliant man, saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, shot right back, I would say, Again, verily, verily, I say unto thee. Jesus was strong, loving, but strong, explicit, to the point. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh, said Jesus, is flesh, and it will always be flesh, we can add. And that which is born of the Spirit, that's Spirit. Then Jesus said, Marvel not. Why are you in a state of amazement? Because I said unto thee, Ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it comes and whither it goes. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto them, him, How can these things be? Not in a smart aleck, sarcastic way, but in an inquisitive way. How can it happen? There's no problem with his desire. The problem was with the fact that he thought it's impossible. How can it happen? Jesus answered, shot right back again, and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel? You're the great teacher, and you don't know these basic spiritual things? Verily, verily, there it is again. I say unto thee, we speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and ye receive not our witness or our testimony. If I have told you, Nicodemus, earthly things, and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of the deeper heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of God which is in heaven. And then Jesus goes on and says some more beautiful and dramatic things. However, I'm going to stop here for a moment and go back on some of the things we've already talked about, already read about. First of all, here is Jesus. He's very busy every day because great crowds are coming. He's teaching them, and he's healing them, and he's casting out devils. That's the ministry that God's called us to in this ministry, to preach and to teach and to cast out devils from people so that they can be set free. Jesus is doing that during the day. Presumably, he rests a little bit at night. But this Nicodemus comes to Jesus, and this Nicodemus, we are told, was a Pharisee. Picture the setting. What was he? Well, let's start at the beginning. Number one, he was a wealthy man. The Bible says later on at the time of Jesus' death, he brought a special mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight, to minister to the dead body of Jesus. Let me tell you, he had to be a wealthy man to get all that kind of thing because it was expensive. So we're talking about a very important member of the community, very famous, very well-known, very wealthy. Then it says something else. He was a Pharisee. Who were the Pharisees? In many ways, they were the best people in the country. In many ways. There was never more than 6,000 of them, and they gave themselves to carrying out the details of the law. The scribes were the one who gave themselves to writing out the law. They weren't as strict or conservative as the Pharisees, but the Pharisees, though they got it mixed up many times, their motive was to keep every jot and tittle of the law. So he was wealthy, he was a Pharisee, but he's more than that. The Bible says he was a ruler of the Jews. The Jews had a kind of a supreme court. It was called the Sanhedrin. There were 70 members of it. He was part of it. He was a member, we would say today, of the Supreme Court. So the top religious act, he's of the Supreme Court, and he's a wealthy man. In other words, he's a brilliant man, and his name is Nicodemus. And it says he came to Jesus by night. Why? Well, probably he was cautious. 
Maybe he was even a little afraid of being seen with Jesus, but probably above all, the Jews always did their studying at nighttime. They didn't have telephones to ring and so forth, but they did have other distractions during the day, so nighttime was the big time for study. And no doubt he wanted to meet with Jesus for a serious discussion about spiritual things. I've got to do something, he said. There were a lot of drifters going through, you know, who said they were Messiah and preaching this, that, and the other thing. But Jesus had these signs following. Miracles were taking place. Nobody could deny it. Jesus grabbed the headlines. The whole known world was talking about him. And Nicodemus said, I've got to go and talk to this man. Kind of condescending, you know. He was up there with the big council. And now he's coming down here to talk to what looked like just a carpenter. And yet he thought he's more than a carpenter. At least he, he, he's got something from God. He's a man of God. I'll give him that. So he didn't come in a hostile way. He wasn't angry. He wasn't confrontational. He was inquisitive. He was wanting to know some things about spiritual values. So it says, He came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, told Jesus, I know you're a teacher. Now that seems very nice and complimentary. And it's true he was a teacher, but in some ways it's pathetic and shows you how far Nicodemus was off course that he only thought that Jesus was a teacher. He didn't recognize that Jesus was the Son of God. But he did say, I recognize you're a teacher. And then he says, we. Who's, who's the we? Well, there must have been some favorable, favorable ones in the council who looked upon Jesus favorably of the Sanhedrin. It doesn't mean that they were about to identify with him or cast their lots in with him. But in private talk, they somewhat admired him. So he included them. We know, he said, us group within the group of the Sanhedrin, we know that you're a teacher come from God. We accept that. God sent you. No, he didn't say he's the son of God, but he said God sent you. You're a teacher. Why? Well, it's obvious. Nobody can do miracles like you do unless God's with them. There's nothing spooky about these. There's no tricks. There's no manipulation. You are performing miracles. I know it. I'm a smart, educated man, but I've got to ask you some questions. But before he could ask another question, before he could say anything, Jesus shot right back, as I said earlier. And Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Nicodemus, you've got to get born again. The Greek word, anathen, for born again really is born from above. Born again, born from above. It really means both of them. So born again is fine, but it's beyond that. It's born again from above. Just like you were born physically, now you've got to be born spiritually. Just like you had an entrance into this new world physically when you came forth from your mother's womb, so likewise, in the spiritual realm, you have to have an entrance. You have to arrive into the spiritual world called the kingdom of God. And Jesus said, I call it being born again. And Nicodemus, this what we would call a big shot, who seemed to do Jesus a great favor, even coming to talk to him. Now, that's not the real picture, but that's what it looked like to many people. And probably to Nicodemus himself. Came at night to study with him and to talk to him. Jesus said, you better get saved. You better get born again nicely, lovingly, but directly and powerfully. Let's deal with first things first. You must. Now, you may think there's a lot of things that you have to do. You know, you have to make that trip. You have to pay that bill. You have to get married to that girl. Or some of you, maybe I have to divorce that man or whatever. Some things you feel you must have to do. Well, there's a must above all musts. You must be born again. That's one that you have to do unless you're content with missing God and missing heaven and missing eternal bliss and going to a lost eternity. Nobody wants to think about that. So Jesus jumped right in and said, ye must be born again. And if you're not spiritually revolutionized, not just go to church or the synagogue, he was part of the Sanhedrin, but to be spiritually revolutionized where the Spirit of God causes you to be born again, this time into the kingdom of God. If you don't get that, he said, Jesus, Jesus made it clear you're never going to get anywhere. What a fantastic privilege to be born again. You can start all over again. 
God will forgive everything that's in the past and you start off with a brand new sheet, as it were. It's terrific. And he'll change your life and give you power and give you new desires and so forth and so on. But let's look at it a bit deeper. What is involved in this business of being born again? Jesus used the term born again, born from above. It's supernatural. It's not natural. It's God that does it in your heart. It's terrific. It's marvelous. It's wonderful. It works. What's the deeper part of it? Well, as I've already said, it means to be born from above. And then it means you gain access or entrance into the kingdom of God. You become part of God's family. Now, it's an absolutely marvelous thing to be a part of the family of God. And you become part of God's family and God's kingdom. You enter into the kingdom of God. And that means what? Well, if you're part of God's family, that must mean you're now his son or daughter. So it's sonship or daughtership. You become a son of God. Think of it. Just like your father and mother give you birth through your mother's womb, providing the sperm, the egg, and so forth and so on, in the natural birth, just think of it. You now are born of the sperma. You're born of the Word of God. You're born by God. God gives you birth. You're born from above. You're into the kingdom. You're God's son. It's rather incredible, isn't it? What else does it involve? It involves eternal life. You see, when you were made a person, you were conceived and then you come through your mother's womb, as we have said, and now you're a baby, you're born. Now you've started as a human baby. Do you know that you'll never cease to exist? You're going to be still in existence a billion, gazillion, quadrillion years from now in one place or the other, heaven or hell with God, or in a lost eternity. You start it, but you'll never cease. And when you get saved, it involves eternal life, not just everlasting life, which more or less talks about length. But eternal life talks about the quality. It's God's kind of life with Him in joy and peace and victory and satisfaction forever. So we're talking about heavy stuff. We're walking in tall cotton. This is important. What is important to you? Your portfolio, your job, your relationship? Those have their importance. I'm telling you what's the most important of all is your relationship with God. And God has given you the opportunity to start all over again by being born from above enter into the kingdom of God, the family of God, which proves you're a son or a daughter and that you have received eternal life. Wow. Eternal zoe, as it is in the Greek. Nicodemus saith unto Jesus, after Jesus said that to him about being born again, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Now, he wasn't being sarcastic or outrageous. Anybody knows that that's a physical absurdity. But what he was actually saying was, I don't say it. It is as absurd as if you had to do that. You know, some, sometimes we have made statements, you know, using hyperbole to make a point. We say certain things to make a point in another thing. This is what he was doing. He didn't really mean this could happen or that Jesus was trying to teach that. He was saying... To be born again like you're talking about to me is as absurd as being born again physically because he could only think in physical terms. Though he was supposed to be a spiritual, religious leader, he really wasn't at the ball game at all. How sad. And so he said, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? And there's something bad about this that he didn't know. And I'll tell you why. If you go away back there to that time, the Jews knew all about being born again, and so did the Greeks. Not quite the way Jesus was talking about, but the concept was there. 
You know, you take the Essenes uh, back there or other, other of the Jewish groups. If somebody was going to come in who was not a Jew to become a Jew, why they would say that he was starting life all over. And this man was a teacher of the Old Testament. He knew what it said there about God talking about, I'll take away the stony heart. I'll give you a heart of flesh. You'll be a new person. I mean, it teaches throughout the Old Testament without using the term born again that we can start all over with God. God's saying that repeatedly. He was a student there, and yet he didn't get it. Didn't get it at all. And so what did Jesus say? Verily, verily, I said unto thee, Jesus is strong. I'm telling you, You've got to get it. He's saying it lovingly and kindly, but he's saying, listen to me, Nicodemus. I know that you're supposed to be a great man. You don't know anything about this, and I'm teaching it to you, and it's critically important that you get the point. You've got to get born again. For he says in verse 5, this is John chapter 3, the gospel of John, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit. What does that mean? Well, when we are saved or born again, the typification, the sim, sim, symbolism of it is, as it says here, the water and the Spirit. The water, even if you go back to the Old Testament, speaks of cleansing. Jesus just came along just after John the Baptist, who was baptizing in water. Jesus is not talking about baptism, but, he, but everybody had it in their heads, and so did Nicodemus, that it speaks of cleansing. So Jesus said, when you get saved, you're cleansed. But it's more than that that's needed. For it's not only of water, but it's of the Spirit. That's what gives power. So we're cleansed, he was saying to him. You're cleansed. Your past sins are wiped out. You're born again. And then you've got power to live for God over the world, the flesh, and the devil. Jesus projected the idea of these two powerful workings within being born again, typified by the water and by the Spirit, cleansing and empowerment by God. Jesus answered, verse 5, I'm reading it again, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water, that is, of the cleansing of the power of God and of the Holy Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And then Jesus said, That which is born of the flesh is flesh. If you're trying to be religious, you're trying to be a good person, perhaps you're a Catholic, you know, and you say the rosary, or you confess your sins, maybe you're a Protestant, you go to church, you're doing religious works. All you're doing is shining up the flesh. But you know, if you've got a car and it's dirty and you clean it, doesn't matter how much you clean it, it's still going to be a car. Jesus said, no matter how many religious works you do, You'll never get saved or born again by doing that because to be saved is not your doing, it's God's doing. And therefore, if it's off the flesh, even if you shine it up and pray 10 hours a day and read the Bible 40 times through without stopping, you're never going to get saved by those things alone. Why? Because that which is off the flesh is flesh. It's religious flesh or any other kind of flesh that he's talking about. But he said, that which is off the spirit is spirit. If it's the Holy Ghost that does it, then it's eternal, it's powerful, and it will work in your life. And anyway, he said to him, marvel not. You know about starting all over with God, Nicodemus. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. Then there is a powerful verse that Jesus goes on to talk about. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. What in the world is he talking about? There's Greek words involved here, the pneuma, Hebrew word ruash. We'll look at it in just a moment or two. Back to the story about Jesus and this great leader, Nicodemus. Didn't know. I remember one time talking to a brilliant doctor with other brilliant businessmen. And uh, this man was one of the top doctors on earth in his particular chosen field. They asked me to speak. It wasn't formal. It was sitting around the dinner table. But they said, Leslie, do you t tell us something that's on your heart. And I said, well, I'd like to start by saying this. Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. And I was getting ready to go on to say something. And this brilliant man, George, you called him, he's a friend of mine. He stopped me. He said, Leslie, stop. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. 
I said, what, George? He said, I don't know what you're talking about. What do you mean, Jesus loves me, this I know? Brilliant man, but didn't know. I wouldn't dare insult you. I'm sure you're brilliant in so many other ways. But do you know that you've got to be born again and the implications of not being born again and the consequences of rejecting Christ's offer? It's very serious. No, it's not threatening. It's just being honest. This was a brilliant man, but he was all mixed up relating to spiritual things. Some people think, you know, as long as you think the Archbishop of Canterbury is great or the Pope or somebody, it's nothing to do with that. It's a relationship with God. So what does it say? Jesus said to him, Marvel not that I said unto ye, ye must be born again. And then Jesus said this, The wind bloweth where it listeth. The, bl the wind, look at the wind, the ordinary wind on the street. It blows wherever it wants to. You hear the sound thereof, but you cannot tell where it came from, and you cannot tell where it went to. Now, that's, you can follow that. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Actually, Jesus is using a word which, when you have it in the Greek or the Hebrew, is the same word for wind and for spirit. In the Greek, it's pneuma. In the Hebrew, it's ruash. And man controls neither one. What was Jesus saying? Let me give you an illustration, he said, about how this happens. He said, let's take the wind, the pneuma, and the wind's blowing. Now you've got evidence, you hear it, you see things being blown, the trees are blown, or the bushes. But he said, you, didn't know, you don't know where it came from, you don't know where it's going to, you don't know all the details about it. Of course not. Well, he said, that's like the person that's born of the Spirit. You will see evidences in your life and in the life of others who get born again. It will be obvious that just as it's obvious when the wind moves a tree, it will be obvious when the Holy Spirit has saved you, things will change in your life, but you'll never know how it happened, just like you don't know all the details of the wind. If you were asked by somebody, where did that wind just come from? Oh, you may say from the north, but you don't have specific details, not even the best. Weathermen have that. And so Jesus was giving this illustration. You don't know that, you don't know this. But I can tell you what you can know. It is a work of the Spirit. It is a work of the Spirit. When a person is being born in the natural, the mother is there, there's people surrounding her to help her, and she delivers that baby. Well, that's a physical. She's pushing physically. Well, let me tell you, when you're born again, it's the Holy Spirit that's doing the work and bringing you into the kingdom of God. And as the baby comes into the new physical world, you come into the spiritual world. So there is a similarity there. There's an analogy that can be used there. The wind bloweth where it, where it wants to. You hear the sign. You don't know the details of it. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can it be? We would say, he wasn't being rude. He just didn't get it yet. We would say, he didn't get it. He didn't get it. Jesus answered and said unto him, now this is a, a kind of a little stinger. It says in our Bible, Art thou a master of Israel? The original doesn't have that. It's not a, the indefinite. It's the it's the definite article. Jesus said to him, Art thou the teacher in Israel? Now, you know, no, no, not teaching about agriculture, as I've said. He was supposed to be a teacher about spiritual things and the things of God, and the teacher didn't know the most basic element about starting all over again after a work of the Holy Spirit is wrought in our hearts in response to our trust, not our money, not our education, not all the good religious works we do, but in trust because of what Jesus did in Calvary for us. Then we're born again. He didn't know it. He just didn't know it. And Jesus said, Art thou the teacher? I mean, it looks like he was the biggest teacher in Jerusalem. For that's what Jesus said. You are the teacher of religious education? And you don't know this? He wasn't embarrassing the man. He was just getting him focused sharply on what he didn't know so that he would have his eyes open to truth. And knowest not these things? Then Jesus said, in case there's any doubt about it, verily, verily, there it is again, for certain, for certain, sure, 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 I say unto thee, we speak that we do know, 
He said, I'm not giving you an opinion just. I'm telling you truth. If you're tuned into this telecast on a regular basis, your spirit is going to witness to you that you hear truth. You know that I'm not after political advantage, manipulation, try to move you psychologically, try to get adrenaline flowing. I'm telling you the truth. And the Holy Spirit then can do the rest if you will open up to him. Jesus said, we speak that we do know and testify what we have seen. You talk about such confidence. You talk about such authority. The last pope who passed away, when he was asked one time when he was being interviewed, when you die, do you know that you're going to heaven? No, he said, I, I, I'm not sure. I don't know about that. No confidence, no authority. But you can know that when you die, you go straight to heaven. Why? Because you were born again, which what? Means you're a son or a daughter of God. You're in the kingdom and you've got eternal life. I really want you to be saved. You can call in and tell us either you got saved or you can call in and ask to be saved and one of our folks will pray with you. But Jesus said more than that to Nicodemus. He said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak that we do know and testify what we have seen and ye receive not our witness, our word, our testimony. I have been preaching this and you will not accept it. You're wrong. There's no good of us discussing this. We're not going to have a compromise or come to a consensus. There's truth and there's error. And I'm giving you the truth with confidence and authority. Jesus could have said those words. And in fact, he did say them in effect when he said, we speak what we know and we testify what we have seen. We're certain that we're telling you the truth. Have you received the truth through this telecast? Have you received the truth? Ye must be born again. How do I get born again? By asking Jesus Christ to come into your heart, to forgive your sins, to enter your name in the Lamb's book of life, and the witness of the Spirit will come in and save you. Now, you don't know how this television set works. You hardly know maybe how a car drives. There's a lot of things we don't know. You don't know everything about being saved, but you can just trust because it works. And Christ will come in when you call upon him and ask him to save you and forgive you and power will come in and you will receive eternal life. Isn't it absolutely wonderful?